Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the September 2022 meeting of Progressive Legacy. Uh, this afternoon, we are very proud and pleased to have as our guest, uh, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo from District 39 in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, Gabriel Acevedo is a Trinidadian American organizer, activist, and politician representing the 39th District. And November 2018, Acevedo finished first place with 31% of the vote and became the first openly gay Afro-Latino and one of the young youngest people ever elected to the Maryland House of Delegates. He is a member of the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, and we are so happy to have him with, this after with us this afternoon. And let me turn it over to you, Delegate Acevedo, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Alan, and good evening, everyone. I uh, want to just say thank you to all of the organizers of this evening's um, dialogue, this evening's discussion. And I say that intentionally because my hope is not to uh, be speaking to you, but for us to be having a conversation on the issues uh, that matter to us, not just as Marylanders, but uh, as people who are committed to progressive legislation, um, people who believe in diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, restorative as well as reparative justice. Um, as well as making sure, as Dr. King put it, we're building uh, what is called a beloved community. So I wanna thank everyone for just uh, providing the space where you know, I can not just share um, a little bit about my experience since being elected to the Maryland General Assembly, um, but also uh, in July, I uh, won my, uh, the primary reelection. And so it's off to the general now in November. Um, and so really excited to also talk as well as engage with each and every one of you all um, about my priorities for the upcoming legislative session, which will begin uh, in January of 2023 and end in April of 2023. And that's particularly important because um, Maryland's uh, legislature is considered as a citizen legislature. We are part time. And so January through April, we are legislating, debating, passing, uh, the state's budget, as well as a number of uh, um, number pieces of legislation uh, that impacts each and every one of us on this call this evening. So it is good to be here. Um, uh, I think uh, Alan provided a pretty um, good uh, description. I'll just say um, that I have, since my family moved to, to Montgomery County, Maryland, I've lived nowhere else. This is where I have done my organizing and my advocacy and my work. Um, I've known Alan for a very long time. Um, Alan has known me since, um, I guess I was, uh, 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 well, I never stopped, but engaging in good trouble. Uh, uh, and that is before being elected. I see my friend, uh, Marilyn Pierre is also on the call as well. Uh, and it is good to, uh, um, it is good to see, oh, and I think I see one of my good friends on here. Uh, and you've joined on your iPad. So, but, um, but thank you also very much for, uh, for having me. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so let me just say that I serve on the House Appropriations Committee, which oversees our state's capital and operating budget, um, as well as social services, uh, collective bargaining, um, uh, as well as um, just ensuring that the business of government is not just funded, but we're holding those uh, various agencies, departments, and department heads accountable for your tax dollars and where it goes. Um, in addition to that, um, I serve on the Public Safety and Administration Subcommittee of Appropriations, which oversees the budget of essentially all of the criminal justice uh, uh, agencies in the state of Maryland, from the Department of Corrections and Public Safety to DJS, the Department of Juvenile Services, et cetera. And so we do a number of things. Um, now, by virtue of the committees that I, um, you know, I am largely focused on our state's budget, um, just, uh, you know, what is coming into our state coffers, what is going out, what we're prioritizing in terms of the budget. Um, I've said it and I continue to say it that a budget is a moral document and that's something that I believe strongly. Um, and so in my capacity as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I've ensured that we're siphoning dollars to the communities that for too long um, have been forgotten or left behind, intentional or otherwise. 
um, but we're also funding the things that we as a community and as a state have identified as a priority, whether that's education, um, whether that's ensuring that we're providing uh, relief to, uh, to seniors and particularly those who are vulnerable right now, um, you know, as we're still coming out of uh, the global pandemic um, and a lot of communities are still reeling. Uh, so while I serve uh, on the Public Safety and Administration Subcommittee, um, you know, a lot of the issues that I work on span from racial, social, economic, uh, gender justice, environmental justice, um, uh, and that largely represents not just the issues that I work on, but the bills that I introduce. So since being elected in 2018, uh, I've been focused on a number of things from police transparency and accountability, which uh, a number of folks are aware, uh, you know, holding, um, you know, my colleagues and those who committed to going far um, uh, uh, and taking um, a very holistic approach to police violence, holding my uh, colleagues accountable to those promises and commitments that we made to you all and to our constituents. Um, but also fighting for uh, guaranteed income, whether it's for Marylanders or for, our, uh, for kids aging out of our foster care system. Um, uh, I think a lot of people are starting to know a little bit more about guaranteed income or direct cash assistance, especially when we have conversations around um, the stimulus check that's been provided and the kind of an impact that has had on several people and several communities to include uh, low income folks. Um, I've also introduced some bills uh, around healthcare. Uh, I have and continue to introduce a bill that's very important um, uh, as it relates to healthcare, and that is the Healthy Maryland Act. Um, uh, this is particularly important because uh, Maryland is the only state in the union uh, that can pass a single payer Medicare for all system compared to other states. We've seen a number of other states try to. Um, uh, to pass universal health care in various forms from Massachusetts to Vermont. Um, but Maryland is really the only state that can do this. Um, and the reason why this is particularly important in the context of health care in this country is because oftentimes we look to our neighbors to the north, Canada, and we look at their health care or Medicare for all system uh, and it's one that we talk about, our, um, our elected officials at the federal level talk about, whether they're praising it or uh, critiquing it. Um, and the reality of it is Canada's uh, Medicare for All system is far better than what we have in this country. Um, and it also ensures that regardless of you know, where you live, uh, that every Canadian has access uh, to health care at the point of service. Um, and it is not something that they're being saddled with debt. Now, the reason why this is particularly important in the context of Maryland is because Canada did not get its um, uh, universal healthcare system or Medicare for all um, uh, as a result of federal legislation. Uh, the reason why Canada has uh, such a very good um, healthcare system is because this issue started in the states or the provinces. We call them states here in Canada, they call them provinces. And so the province of Saskatchewan passed universal health care in that state for the people that live there. Again, Saskatchewan is a province in Canada. Uh, and the system that they set up, the legislation that they passed at the provincial or state level worked so well that the federal government later ended up adopting it and expanding it nationally. And so that is why you see Canada having the healthcare system that it has today. It didn't start at the federal level. It started at the state or provincial level. Similarly, in the United States, we do not have um, a healthcare system that ensures everyone in this country is covered and uh, it is free healthcare at the point of service, which I fundamentally believe in because we live in the richest state in the union per capita, that's Maryland. That's not according to me. Maryland is the richest state in the union per capita. Look it up, right? We live in the richest state in the union and we live in the wealthiest country in human history. Uh, and despite that, we are still seeing over half a million Marylanders who are uninsured, a majority of whom are people of color, majority of whom are women, low income folks. And this is in the richest state in the union that has the ability to pass single payer Medicare for all or my bill, which is the Healthy Maryland Act that would set up that uh, healthcare system and would allow Maryland to be a model for the rest of the nation. 
and really for the federal government where we've seen an action to be able to adopt a state policy and expand it. And the reason why this is particularly important with Maryland is because we have already led the country on national issues before, whether it's marriage equality that I was proud to be a part of or on question four, which is the DREAM Act. For folks who aren't familiar, the DREAM Act was federal or national legislation that failed uh, in Congress uh, that would have ensured that undocumented uh, students and immigrants are able to pursue higher education, among other things. And so it failed at the federal level, and Maryland was the only state to pick it up at the state level and not just pass it legislatively, but pass it by a referendum. And so I give these examples so that we know what we're capable of doing and what is possible. And we have an opportunity to not just ensure that the over half a million people in our state have health insurance, but we're showing the rest of the country what um, uh, people-centered healthcare looks like and what removing the profit incentive out, out of our healthcare industry, which um, uh, 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 we currently have a profit motive with our healthcare system. And this is why we're seeing what we're seeing, whether it's um, you know, exploiting people who are seeking healthcare to uh, medical debt, to um, you know, what insurance uh, providers are covering. Um, all of these things are the result of uh, a system that prioritizes profit over people. Uh, and so I'll continue to introduce the Healthy Maryland Act because I know we can get it done. And with a democratic governor coming in and a democratic state le legislature, it is more than possible for us to ensure that everyone in this state has health insurance. Uh, I'll also talk about the environmental piece. As you know, the, the state legislature has been doing a number of issues, um, passed a number of legislation on environment from CJA, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, to the Climate Solutions Now Act of this year. Uh, and I want to point that out because one, Maryland is a coastal state. When we think about climate change, we have to think about that because coastal states are in the United States are at the forefront of the climate crisis. We are going to be impacted uh, the most and first, right? Not Midwestern states, not states that are landlocked, coastal states and Maryland is a coastal state. And so what that means is that we have to be a little bit more ambitious and I say, and I dare say aggressive with the way that we legislate to ensure that we're meeting uh, uh, the goals that we have set for ourselves as a state uh, on what we need to do to, re to reduce climate emissions, um, to ensure that we're transitioning to a green economy and we're weaning ourselves off of coal. Uh, and you would not think that in a progressive state as, as Maryland, uh, that we are still burning coal for energy, but we are, as a state, we rely on six coal plants still. So we're burning coal, we're polluting the environment, um, uh, as well as uh, um, you know, uh, our waterways, et cetera. Um, and we're not transitioning to a green economy that would ensure that we're protecting the good union jobs from these coal industries, but we're also transitioning to something cleaner, better, uh, uh, and um, would allow us to, to do our part as a state in reducing uh, our emissions. Uh, and so while we pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act and the Climate Solutions Now Act, there's still a lot of things that we need to do with respect to the environment. And so I plan on introducing a Green New Deal for Maryland. I know we talk a lot of, uh, about a Green New Deal at, at the national level. And the reality of it is what we're doing here in Maryland is we are taking aspects of the Green New Deal, such as the Clean Energy Jobs Act and the Climate Solutions Now Act. And we're introducing it, the legislative process, how it works is what you put in doesn't mean that's what you're going to get out as far as a bill, right? And so what we have, while it certainly is um, a, a strong piece of legislation um, in terms of our state's commitment, whether it's transitioning to, um, you know, transitioning school buses to, um, uh, to electric, uh, to ensuring that, you um, uh, we are doing more to um, uh, outfit public buildings so that they're green um, and they're not contributing to the kind of emissions that we see. Uh, and I'll also say that we still in this state um, provide um, tax, uh, well, I don't want to say tax breaks, but we subsidize coal, um, uh, 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 not coal plants, um, uh, incinerators. And for folks who aren't familiar, uh, Montgomery County has an incinerator 
Dickinson. There's an incinerator in Baltimore City. There are incinerators um, in communities across this country and the impact that it has uh, on neighboring communities. And when I say neighboring communities, I'm not just talking about the communities that live close to incinerators. I'm talking about communities that are also a little bit further because how, you know, we, we don't think that all of this pollution, all of these chemicals go into the air and these, and the, and the air is then taking those chemicals uh, 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 and that pollution to other communities. It doesn't just stay there, right? And so we have to consider, um, you know, Maryland's role in not just uh, ending subsidies for incinerators, but we're moving away from that to composting to more sustainable ways uh, of recycling. Um, as far as uh, 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 as far as gender justice, I uh, I want to just talk a little bit about um, a couple of bills. Um, one that I work on and one that I plan on introducing, and that is the LGBTQ plus senior bill of rights. Um, SAGE is a national LGBTQ senior, um, uh, seniors advocacy group. Uh, and every single year, Maryland gets uh, pretty poor ratings in terms of how LGBTQ seniors are treated. Um, reporting in use and so all of these uh, concerns we want to ensure that all of our owners are able to able to dignity and with respect and protections uh, and to use civil rights similar to what have been passed in other states there's kind of but we're providing protections for all seniors, regardless of who you are, where I'm, who you identify, and who you love. You should be a great sentiment of the protections uh, like anybody else. All right. Are you breaking up a bit? It appears as though this is a breaking up situation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, and so picking up where I left off on gender justice and LGBTQ equality, uh, just some more work that we got to do to ensure that we are taking care of and protecting LGBTQ plus homeless youth. Um, uh, LGBTQ uh, youth homelessness is a serious issue and often um, uh, not spoken about in the larger conversation around homelessness, but picking up. Uh -oh. Yeah, because he's calling from a phone and uh, that happens with phones. Wow. This isn't fair. Oh, this guy is very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One, okay, can, can, can you hear me now? Or are we yeah, good? We're good break? now. Okay. All right. We'll try this again. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so just, uh, you know, ending what, what, uh, uh, on the last thing that I mentioned about ending youth, um, uh, youth homelessness, uh, particularly LGBTQ youth homelessness, we now have to commit the dollars, uh, to the, to the legislation that we pass, uh, to ensure mm -hmm. that we're actually making, um, uh, a meaningful difference. Now, as far as, uh, the, uh, issue of racial justice, I wanted to talk um, about a number of issues that I think are particularly important as it relates to Maryland. Um, you know, some of it deals with police transparency and accountability. Others deal with uh, in the area of juvenile justice, um, but it really represents the unfinished work, in my opinion. Um, for folks who are following, you probably know that the Maryland General Assembly last year passed uh, the um, uh, the Police Accountability Act of 2021, which does a number of things. And in the mm -hmm. Police Accountability Act that was passed, it included Anton's Law, uh, a bill mm -hmm. that I've been using since getting elected uh, that was named for Anton Black. Uh, if you watched Meet the Press last weekend or a couple of weekends ago, they did a session on Anton mm -hmm. Black as an officer, but also the, 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 the bill that I um, introduced and helped pass um, in addition to that, um, uh, Lester Holt did a more extensive uh, piece on it, just sort of exploring um, mm. 
uh, 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 the, the, the other side to this incident because, um, you know, as I've said before, and I continue to say um, what happened to Anton Black, and that's precisely why, you know, in introducing Anton's law and working with the Coalition for Justice for Anton Black and his family uh, to ensure that we're not just letting his death uh, uh, be forgotten, which is all too often in the United mm -hmm. States um, when it comes to police mm -hmm. violence, but we are also raising uh, awareness about what needs to be done legislatively. And so when Anton was killed uh, in 2018, uh, I had reached out because, you know, for some folks who are familiar, I've been working on uh, police transparency and accountability prior to being elected to uh, the legislature. And I still work on this issue because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe uh, that we have to go beyond just this lip service uh, that um, mm -hmm. Black people have had to, to, to hear and endure for too long from policymakers, both Black, mm -hmm. White, Asian and otherwise, because everybody has been coming with the same kind of a narrative when it comes to police violence. We're going to do something about it. We're going to, you know, pass a bill. We're going to, you know, make sure that we're putting body cameras on officers and all of those things are fine and well, but we have to get uh, really uh, to, um, and that's what it means to be radical. It means to explore an issue at its root. Um, and we have to start exploring the issue of police violence at its root. Um, I will share in the, um, in the Zoom uh, chat uh, an op-ed, two op-eds that I've worked on. One that I wrote, one was in 2020, um, titled, When Pain is the Prerequisite for Progress. And I not only talk about Anton's law in the case of Anton mm -hmm. Black, but why we need to repeal the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights, which mm -hmm. Marilyn state to pass that essentially provides officers with these privileges above and mm -hmm. beyond what you and I have as ordinary people. Uh, and so while we repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, and I certainly uh, applaud the legislature in doing that and passing Anton's law, there's significant work that we still need to do. Uh, and I wrote a piece uh, just this year uh, titled The Unfinished Work of Police Accountability in Maryland. And the reason why I did that is because I noticed a lot of people are celebrating the passage of the Police Accountability Act of 2021, and that's fine. Um, you know, I think it's a strong piece of legislation that could have been stronger um, uh, had they accepted some of the amendments uh, and the concerns mm -hmm. sharing for a very long time. Um, uh, for folks who, who may not know, in 2020, after uh, you know, the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, our new speaker, Adrian Jones, established uh, the uh, work group, the House Work Group on Police Accountability in Maryland. And she appointed me to that work group. And over six months, what we did was we listened to stakeholders, community leaders, activists, mm -hmm. advocates, um, experts, attorneys, et cetera. But we also discussed amongst ourselves what are some of the um, uh, uh, police accountability issues that we should be addressing. Um, uh, and I raised a number of concerns that unfortunately did not make the report that came out from that work group mm -hmm. because after all of our work, we did produce a report uh, that everyone can access, can take a look at. If you look at the House Work Group on Police Accountability in Maryland report, it's a PDF, it's online. You can see all of what we've done um, uh, and all of our policy recommendations. However, throughout those meetings, I would raised a number of concerns that I'm going to share now that I think are related to police accountability that we don't talk about but aren't addressing. And the first thing is community oversight and control. This is particularly important because when we talk about disciplinary action, when we talk about oversight and control over law enforcement, it is not just about injecting civilians into a process, like a participatory process, right? You get to show up. You get the agenda, you get to speak, you get to ask a question, and then you get to go home. That is not what civilian oversight and control of law enforcement looks like. And that was one of the issues that I was attempting to prevent, because if we look across the country, we see civilian review boards, um, which are essentially set up. There are civilians on them, but they're a pit bull without teeth. So in other words, mm -hmm. they don't have investigatory powers. They do not have disciplinary powers. So if you can't investigate police misconduct and abuse, and if you can't levy discipline against an officer or officers who have harmed the community, then what is civilian oversight and control and what does accountability look like in that mm -hmm. regard? And so 
when the bill had um, the Police Accountability Act, when it came to the floor, I was the lone Democrat that stood up and offered four amendments to that bill. And those four amendments are the concerns that I shared with leadership and with the caucus, as well as members of my work group. So it was no surprise, right? Um, unfortunately, none of those amendments pass. In order for an amendment to pass or to be a part of a bill, three members of the House must at least stand in front of the Speaker's eye view in order for her to call a vote to add that mm -hmm. amendment to the bill. No one stood for it, and we could get yeah. into that, the politics and all of those types of stuff, but none of those amendments passed, and those amendments were essentially civilian oversight and control and ensuring that uh, the police accountability boards, the PABs, which is what we passed, as enabled legislation for localities, and I'm sure you all have been following that the Montgomery County Council and, I, um, and uh, uh, Mark Elrich has been putting together local PAB legislation and communities have been expressing concerns about the makeup of those police accountability boards. And the reason why they're expressing concerns is because we did not do as a state legislature what we're supposed to have done, which is ensure that there are civilians that are not just making up the majority of these PABs, but that they have investig uh, investigatory as well as disciplinary powers. So that's the first thing. Mm. Second thing, um, and the second amendment that I had introduced was an amendment on white nationalism in law enforcement. We do not talk about this enough. Um, in fact, we don't talk about it at all. But what we acknowledge is that policing in America the institution of policing in America comes out of slave patrols and a, and, mm -hmm. and a very white premises foundation. That is not according to me. That's a matter of history. Mm -hmm. and we acknowledge that and the institutions that we see today are built on the very same foundation mm -hmm. that we're talking about right now. So if we aren't looking or addressing the issue of white nationalism in law enforcement, we're essentially allowing you know, officers who belong to these far right, white nationalists and right wing groups to be policing our neighborhoods and to also have the license to kill and then having the law behind them uh, in order to uh, protect them, right? Now, while that may not necessarily be the case in Maryland because of what we passed, it is still the case uh, in very much uh, a majority of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, who represents Maryland's Congressional District 8, sits on the subcommittee on civil um, rights and civil liberties, and they had released this unredacted FBI assessment about white nationalism in law enforcement, uh, and it should concern anybody who cares about uh, community, whether you be mm -hmm. white, black, Jewish, LGBTQ, Latino, Hispanic, Asian, Essentially, what this report said is that white nationalism is not only pervasive in law enforcement throughout this country, that if we do not address it, that it will continue uh, to breed racialized policing, division, mm -hmm. more protests, and certainly upheaval. And so one of the things that I was hoping to do with the Police Accountability Act, and I raised this issue on the work group, was ensure that we're investigating, rooting out, and holding law enforcement officers who belong to white nationalist groups or um, uh, uh, white supremacist groups, ensuring that we're rooting out those individuals from law enforcement agencies. Uh, that amendment, unfortunately, did not pass. Uh, the third one was uh, on ending qualified immunity in state court. A number of us uh, are, have been following conversations at the national level about ending qualified immunity. What the House of Representatives ended up doing was passing a reformed qualified immunity. They didn't end it, but they reformed it. This is at the federal level. What states can do is end qualified immunity for law enforcement officers at the state level. And for folks who aren't familiar with that, um, uh, uh, qualified immunity is essentially a judge-created legal doctrine. We legislatures didn't pass a law saying that law enforcement officers should be, have these protections under the law, these legal protections. A judge created this legal doctrine of qualified immunity that essentially uh, allows officers who abuse their positions in public trust to not be held accountable in court. And what's more is that when people do take these officers to court, the people who are responsible, whether it's for paying those um, uh, settlements uh, to the family and the uh, to the community are you and I. 
you and I. 